Okay, I'm delighted to welcome as our next speaker, yeah, Professor Andrew Gregory from University College London. He's going to tell us about Democritus versus Aristotle. Are there atoms and empty space? Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to talk about a feud in the ancient world between Democritus, who is usually reckoned to be the first atomist, and Aristotle, who denied that there are any such things as atoms or any such thing as a void for the atoms to move around in. So let me just set an overview first, because um, there are a couple of other people to talk about who are interesting in this context. Firstly, there's <clears throat> an ancient Greek philosopher called Parmenides, who lives around those dates. He has some entertaining views. We'll come to those in a minute. And um, the first atomists, Leucippus and Democritus, act very much in reaction to Parmenides. So that's probably the first feud. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Plato on matter as well, as he has things to say about um, the early atomists. And then I'll talk a little bit about Aristotle. So to start with, dear old Parmenides, he argued these things. It is not possible for nothing to exist. It is not possible for more than one thing to exist. Therefore, there is only one thing that it exists. It is not possible for there to be any change. And the one thing that it exists is spherical. Why have I got a question mark here? <laughs> People in the ancient world one, did not know what to make of this, and scholars right up to the present day do not know exactly what to make of this. Whether this is Parmenides' actual position is one issue. That he argued for this, that's, that's, un, that's undoubted. Um, why does he think um, there's only one thing? Well, if he's actually right about noth nothing does not exist, and what can you say about nothing? And that's a serious question. You know, is there anything you can say about nothing? And Parmenides thinks if you can't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Right? So that leaves you with what exists. So what exists? Can it be lots of things? Well, what separates the things that exist? It's not what doesn't exist, because that doesn't exist. So that leaves you with this possibility that there is only one thing, and it is spherical. Um, the spherical thing is an argument from symmetry, and he's, he's quite specific about that. Let me then take you to the reply of Leucippus and Democritus. They say it is possible for nothing to exist, and that nothing is empty space or the void. So you now have what is, and they say there are many things that are. And those things are indivisible, literally in the ancient Greek, atomos, uncuttable. Right? So the first atoms are little Parmenidean worlds, and there are a multiplicity of them, and they move around in empty space. Change, according to the atomists, occurs because there is a motion of those atoms, and we see change when those atoms come together to form macro objects, or they come apart again um, just to be atoms. So this effectively is the first part of the feud between uh, Leucippus and Democritus and Parmenides. The atomists want to is, is assert, look, there is a void, and these little atoms move around in the void. Those atoms don't change at all. They're uncuttable, indivisible. Shape, size, and number of atoms. So this is a report we have on Leucippus' um, works. Leucippus supposed there to be an infinite number of atoms that are always in motion and have an infinite number of shapes. So in denial of Parmenides' idea that there's only one thing and it's spherical, Leucippus and Democritus believe there are an infinite number of atoms and an infinite number of shapes. So any shape and size you like. Bonding is purely physical, and it occurs by entanglement. So these atoms have all sorts of shapes and sizes, and if you can imagine some odd shapes and atoms, they all cling together like that. Um, not cling in the modern sense of being attracted to each other, but they will actually just interlock with each other. 
and change at the level of human perception happens when enough of these atoms become entangled together to form a macro object which we can perceive and again those macro objects can come apart um, through um, motion and shaking around. This is Aristotle talking about Leucippus and Democritus. He says, being, they say, differs only in shape, arrangement, and position. A differs from N in shape, AN from NA in arrangement, and Z from N in position. So there's this theme in Greek philosophy that there should be something that doesn't change. And for the early atomists, it's the atoms that don't change. Um, that's why they say that being, Aristotle says here, that being only differs um, in the shape, arrangement, and position of those atoms. Um, I quite like the graphic that um, PowerPoint threw up from this. There in the middle, you've got all these different shapes of atoms all congregated together into a macro object, lots of little atoms moving around the outside. I think that's quite good as a vision of um, what Leucippus and Democritus thought the world was like at the micro level. They have quite a strong take on the nature of this world. So again, this is a fragment of Leucippus. Nothing comes to be at random, but everything for a reason and by necessity. Also important is this fragment from Democritus, who said, by convention sweet, by convention bitter, by convention hot, by convention cold, by convention colour. But in reality, atoms and the void. Right? So that's again a very strong thing to say and it puts forward quite a strong um, what's technically known as a reductive program. So what we see and perceive in our world, bitterness, temperature, um, colour, they aren't actually there, there's just atoms in the void. We're a set of atoms in the void, there's a set of atoms and void out there, we perceive those atoms in certain ways, but qualities like red or heat aren't actually there, it's just atoms in the void. So that sets quite a strong um, reductive program. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on because Aristotle, that's one thing that Aristotle would want to object to. One question you might ask yourself is how strong the, the affinities are between what I've just described about Leucippus and Democritus and modern atomic theory. I think the first thing to say about Leucippus and Democritus is actually probably the first example of a two-level theory where human beings have thought, OK, there's a macro world which we inhabit, there's also a micro world, and that micro world is actually radically different from the macro world. Let me talk a little bit about dear old Plato, who is also entertaining and intriguing on what makes up the world. Plato had a complex theory of atomism where he has simple triangles which make up three-dimensional, inverted commas, atoms of earth, water, air and fire. So the ultimate parts of matter for Plato are two types of triangle. Right. There's the 1, 1, root 2 triangle and the 1, root 3, 2 triangle. Right. These are the ultimate building blocks of matter for Plato. And you can fit them together like this. So there you've got your two basic building blocks at the top. The 1, 1, root 2 triangles form up in fours into squares like that and then they can form up into a cube like that with six square faces. The one root three, two triangles, six of them join up to form that sort of triangle, and four of them draw up, form up to form a tetrahedron. I was most amused about this overhead, which I admit to nicking off of Google Images, because Google Images nicked it out of one of my books. <laughs> Oh dear, when, when Wikipedia first started, I was amused to find some of my lecture notes turning up on Wikipedia. Obviously, my students had copied them and sold them to Wikipedia. <laughs> What's the next bit of Plato's um, matter theory? There are platonic solids. 
Uh, these are the five platonic solids known in the ancient world. What is special about them? They are made up of identical faces. So the cube is made up of six identical squares. The tetrahedron is made up of four identical triangles. What Plato wants to say is the cube is Earth. The icosahedron, 20-faced uh, entity, um, is water. The octahedron, eight faces, is air and fire is the tetrahedron. And Plato's idea is, right, here we have um, the four earth, water, air, fire, the four elements of classical Greek theory. We can account for these by saying, OK, these are the shapes of their, inverted commas, atoms. Those atoms come apart into smaller constituents like that. The big question. Why? Why has Plato put this together in this manner? If you ask Plato, he will say, these are the best, the simplest and most elegant. And he would say that although the world appears complex and diverse, there's an underlying um, order and a mathematical order, and that order is simple, elegant, and aesthetically pleasing. Let me just read you a little passage from Plato where he's describing these things. This we hypothesize as a principle of fire and of the other bodies. But the principles of these, which are higher, are known only to God and whoever is friendly to him. It is necessary to give an account of, of the nature of the four best bodies, different to each other, with some able to be produced out of the others by dissolution. You must be eager then to bring together the best four types of body and to state that we adequately grasp the reason for the nature of these bodies. Of the two triangles, the isosceles has one nature, the scalene an unlimited number. Of this unlimited number, we must select the best if we intend to make the, uh, begin in the proper manner. If someone has singled out anything better for the construction of these bodies, his victory will be that of a friend rather than an enemy. We shall pass over the many and postulate the best triangles. Right? I, th I think we get Plato's drift here. You know, we, 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 we want the best ones. OK, so Plato has what is known as a teleology, a sort of end-directed or good-directed account of nature. It probably is one of the passages where it comes out most strongly. Um, I think an important factor here is that Plato thinks that when the origin of the cosmos happens, there is a chaos to start with. He then has his craftsman god fashion an ordered cosmos out of that. What are the criteria that, that craftsman god uses to create the world? Well, he uses the best criteria, um, the best tools for it, and therefore he must have reason for choosing certain um, shapes, particles, or whatever, over the other. And that's why Plato phrases it in this manner. Ah. Let me try to just run a little bit of philosophy of science off of this. Think yourself back to when you did O-level chemistry and you were given an atom of carbon and four atoms of hydrogen and some rods to join them together. Right? You remember doing that? Right? What shape are the atoms? Spheres. Spheres. Sir, you are an excellent Platonist. Why? Because you have chosen a mathematically simple and beautiful idea for the shape of an atom rather than follow Leucippus and Democritus and say they're all shapes and sizes. Now let's move on to A-level chemistry and you are told about electrons, protons, and neutrons. What shape are electrons, protons, and neutrons at A-level chemistry? I see a lot of nodding, and I see a lot of uh, further followers of Plato in this matter, because you all know they are spherical, are they not? Right? Behind that ancient world, um, talk of Plato, I think there is this principle, and Professor Roos talked about it earlier on. For some people in science, beauty matters. And for Plato, certainly beauty mattered. And part of his feud with Leucippus and Democritus is precisely that. Um, for Plato, he's going to say, there are a small number of mathematically well-defined ultimate parts of the world. 
Leucippus and Democritus are going to say, no, there are all sorts of shapes and sizes, and these things are at random. Plato would also say, a small number of mathematically well-defined atoms are designed, and they are the best ones. Behind that is another row um, that occurs in the ancient world, and it's interesting to see this um, feud being resurrected in the 21st century. The early atomists thought there were an, an unlimited number of cosmoids. Uh, cosmoid is just plural, ancient Greek plural for cosmos. Just cosmoses doesn't sound very good. Okay? So they thought the, um, the Leucippus Democritus thought there was <clears throat> an infinite void, an infinite number of atoms, and there are infinite number of worlds or cosmoi within that void. And they thought those came about by accident. Our cosmos just has um, an order which we explain as part of an infinite array of these. Plato, on the other hand, says no. There is one cosmos, only one cosmos, there can only ever be one cosmos, and that has been well designed. Right? And that ultimately is um, an important physics feud between Plato and Leucippus and Democritus. Do we explain what we see around us in terms of a multiplicity of accidents, or do we see some sort of order, beauty, and design in the world? And Plato, of course, goes very strongly for the order, um, beauty, and design. Aristotle, of course, has criticisms of Plato. And um, the little um, illustration there, that's from the center of Raphael's school of Athens. That's Plato and Aristotle having a debate. Quite what they're having a debate about, that's a different matter. Um, Aristotle says, look, Plato, when you take the matter apart into planes, why don't you just stop at planes? Why don't you stop at triangles? Surely that's entirely arbitrary. And he asks a question that's puzzled philosophers ever since. What on earth are those planes meant to be made of? Right? Are they just geometrical? But geometric, just geometry doesn't make up things. Are they meant to be matter in case that, that's really puzzling? Why do they join up as regular solids? That's equally puzzling as puzzled people since. Um, Imagine you have those little atoms as um, icosahedra, tetrahedron, all the rest of it. What happens when the planes come apart? Does that mean there's a temporary void there? And Aristotle, as I'll say in a moment, is absolutely against the idea of any sort of void or vacuum. And Aristotle questions, OK, but do the solids pack together? Do they tessellate properly? Do they occupy all the space? Because if not, then there is empty space, and empty space is not allowed according to Aristotle. I'll come back to Aristotle's reason why empty space isn't allowed um, in a moment. Aristotle, um, fourth century BC, has an unparalleled influence. He's a great systematizer. It's very difficult to get rid of Aristotle's thinking because it's so comprehensive and so systematic. And I think it's only with the advent of René Descartes and his mechanical take on the world that Aristotle really gets um, superseded. Um, there are debates about it, but nothing that really can take Aristotle's um, position. The theory of natural place, I think, is the key to Aristotle's thought, um, certainly within his physics, but that spills out into other parts of his thought as well. So, Aristotle on matter. Aristotle follows most of the ancient Greeks in saying, right, there are four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. And they are characterized by two pairs of opposites, uh, wet and dry, hot and cold. So earth is cold and dry, water, um, cold and wet, air, wet and hot, and all the rest of it. Um, in principle, those elements can transmute into each other, and they can do so unproblematically. So um, I think Aristotle would, if an alchemist came up to Aristotle, I think Aristotle would scratch his head and say, what on, what on earth are you talking about? What's the problem? Of course, earth, water, air, and fire um, can change into each other, but there's nothing strange about that. That happens in a purely straightforward and natural manner. Okay. But Aristotle would say, um, all things um, in the terrestrial realm are made up of earth, water, air, and fire, some combination of those. And behind those lay the two principles of um, cold, wet, uh, hot, and dry. Now, what Aristotle thinks of as elements here are probably more akin to what we would think of in the modern world as phases. So, earths are effectively solids, waters are liquids, airs are gases, 
and fire is fires. That doesn't quite match up, but you, you get the general drift of um, what's going on there. As Professor Roos said, Aristotle has an idea of natural motion. Very important here, Aristotle has no conception of gravity. He knows that if you throw something in the air, it will fall down and all the rest of it, but he does not explain that in terms of gravity, nor does he explain the motion of the planets in terms of gravity. So Earth is held to be heavy and has a natural place at the center of the universe. Right? So Aristotle's cosmos is an absolute one, and that center of that cosmos is a physically important place in the sense that Earth moves straight down to the center of the universe. Water is less heavy. It too moves straight down to the center of the universe. That's its natural place. But then if we think cosmologically, you've got the Earth as a rough sphere surrounded by water fitting into all the hollows. Okay. Now, <coughs> now, important. Air is positively light. It is not heavy. It is positively light. By that means, Aristotle means, that it does not move towards the centre, it moves towards the extremes of the terrestrial realm. And again, it moves in a straight line when it's moving naturally. Fire is held to be lightest, and its natural place is at the edge of the terrestrial realm. Right. So you get this sort of onion effect in Aristotle. In the centre, you've got earth, surrounded by water, surrounded by air, surrounded by fire. They each have their natural motions, and if they are unimpeded, and ah, I have found a nice prop, something that isn't going to damage the lecture theatre or any of the students. <laughs> so um, this is metal. So metals for Aristotle are mostly um, earth, but with a bit of water there as well. Why? Because um, metals ultimately will melt. Right? So they are solids, so they're mostly earth, but they have, must have a principle of fluidity in them as well. Right? So um, stones have less earth. But so at the moment, I'm stopping this from executing its natural motion. Off it goes, and I stop it again. Right? For Aristotle, no forces are required for something to execute its natural motion. Forces are only required to stop it from doing its natural motion. And this is the bit where I have to make sure I don't damage any students. Um, there are also Enforce motion, that's an enforce motion which will gradually die out for Aristotle because it's not natural in a straight line. There is also a fifth element for Aristotle known as the ether or quintessence. That goes round in circles, that's its circular motion, um, and that is what is natural to it. Um, let me take you to a diagram of Aristotle's cosmos. Earth in the middle, earth, water, air, fire, up to the realm of the moon, outwards in the celestial realm, out to the fixed stars. Professor Roos has always, um, already um, described some of this, so I, I won't say a lot of it again. Um, interestingly for Aristotle, he thinks that mathematics applies precisely to the heavenly realm, but not so to the terrestrial realm. I'll just give a couple of reasons for that. Imagine a perf geometrically perfect sphere on a geometrically perfect plane. How many points does, we, uh, does the geometrically perfect sphere touch the geometrically perfect plane? One. One. Excellent. Good. Now, imagine a football on a field. Uh, how many points does a football touch the field? And the answer is lots. So says Aristotle, the abstractions of pure mathematics are not applicable to the real world. Right? So Aristotle says mathematics are not important. Um, again, the key figure here is Galileo, who who's in many ways introduces applied mathematics, and that's what Aristotle is lacking. Um, Aristotle thinks the world is made up of qualities, which I'll come to in a moment, and he thinks those are difficult to quantify, and he tends to think or in terms of what's that white, White, whiter, whitest, hard, harder, hardest, rather than in terms of quantities. There is also this. Imagine you have two comedians and each tells you a joke. Is it proper to say that one of those jokes is 1.8654327 times as funny as the other joke? 
No? What excellent Aristotelians you are! Because <laughs> Aristotle would want to say funny, funnier, funniest in relation to jokes, right? Now, you've got the point about jokes. Aristotle applies that to the rest of the world. He thinks that the rest of the world should be described in that manner rather than in precise quantitative terms. Aristotle explanation. Aristotle thinks that everything has a potential which it will actualize. So um, an acorn will grow into a tree and it has the potential to do so unless something stops it from doing so. So everything will seek to actualize its potential. Now note that that is fundamentally a biological paradigm or allegory for explanation. Aristotle will use biological modes of explanation within physics, right? So when we have this piece of earth, if I let it go, it will actualize its potential to move towards the center of the earth, right? So Aristotle, instead of explaining biology in terms of physics, tends to explain physics in terms of biological explanations. That's quite widespread in the ancient world, but again, that's going to um, dis uh, dissociate him from Leucippus and Democritus um, quite strongly. What Aristotle would say is that all objects have a natural place. They're going to go there unless stopped. Um, Earth has potential to be at the center of the universe. All objects fall, fall unless prevented and fire has the potential to be at the periphery of the terrestrial realm. Ether has the potential to keep on moving and it will keep on moving in circles and it actualizes that potential. For Aristotle, there's a sense in which the heavens are more actual than the terrestrial realm because this, the ether is always actualizing its potential. Why is there a fifth element for Aristotle? Because he recognizes earth, water, air and fire are always changing but he thinks in the heavens there is no change, therefore they must be made up of a different element. He recognises, yes, okay, um, sun, moon, five planets, um, all move relative to the fixed stars, but he knows from the Babylonian records that they move in cycles, so there's no overall change in these things. So he wants to say there's a fifth element there um, which doesn't change at all. How would we explain a tree well, we would go botany, biology, biochemistry, chemistry, physics, would we not? But that is to assert a specific direction of explanation. That is to explain from the biological to the physical, and also to assert a reductive type of explanation, which is to say that we can explain um, the biological level at the biochemical level, and you can explain that in turn at the chemi chemical level. Aristotle would reject that mode of explanation and say that we must explain this biologically and holistically. Last thing to hit you with, I think. Qualitative metaphysics. Aristotle believed that... Sorry, let me rephrase that. If you give the atomists a catalogue of, tell the atomists to give you a catalogue of what makes up the world, they would say atoms and void. If you ask Aristotle, he would say the world is made up of qualities. So what is this? <laughs> it is whiteness, it is flatness, it is impenetrability, it is coldness. And that is what is there for Aristotle. Right? Aristotle did not believe that the world came apart into atoms. He thinks that these qualities are real. So Aristotle is, in effect, a WYSIWYG philosopher. What you see is what you get, right? You see these, they are there, and that's what causes you to see them, because they really are there. Aristotle also thinks that behind all this is something called prime matter. So if you think of an object, this one will do. Careful, Andy, these break. What happens if you take all the qualities away from that? That hasn't got many qualities. Let me have something else. Eee. Take away whiteness, roundness, plasticiness, 
and all the other qualities from this, and what have you got left? And I don't expect a, a definite answer to that because it's a philosophical conundrum that's gone on from Aristotle's time. Some people say nothing, this is just its qualities. Aristotle would say, no, there is something left, and that is prime matter, something that is just matter without any qualities. Aristotle doesn't think that prime matter actually exists, only exists potentially, because he thinks that um, whereas you might think of a different shape for this thing, you can't think of it without shape, right? But he thinks there is prime matter there. So for Aristotle, the world up is made of prime matter with um, these qualities. That means the world is a plenum, it's densely packed, and Aristotle thinks there can be no vacuum. Why does he think there's no vacuum? Rate of motion for Aristotle is proportional to the resistance of a medium. Take the medium away, so you've got a nice big zero on one side of your proportionality re relation, and that means the other side must be infinite. Things cannot move at infinite speed. That is inconceivable, and we do not see that in nature. Therefore, there is no vacuum. End of debate. No vacuum for Aristotle. So he thinks that what Leucippus and Democritus are up to is um, inconceivable and totally mistaken because he thinks their atoms would start move, to move at an infinite speed and that simply can't happen. There has to be some resistance put up um, by the medium. Um, this bit I've already done, this is about quantification, so I'll finish by just summing up this feud between Aristotle and Democritus. Aristotle says, no atoms, no void. Right? Qualitative metaphysics and prime matter and a plenum. Qualities are fundamental for Aristotle. And Aristotle will not allow a reduction in qualities. Qualities are real, they're actually out there. There really is whiteness here. There really is hardness and all the rest of it. Leucippus and Democritus would say things roughly like we would say in the modern world, only not quite so sophisticated. Why do we see that as red? Because it, it gives off um, light of a certain wavelength, and our brain sort of interprets that as red. Is it actually red? Are the atoms that make that up actually red? No. So the quality of redness we reduce down to something else. But Aristotle would say, no, qualities are real, and I'm not going to have them reduced. Aristotle would also say, matter has potential, it can actualize, it is not inert, it is not just dead matter, it is something that matter can do. Aristotle would also say the physical needs to be explained biologically, not the biological explained in terms of the physical. Aristotle would also say, there is one and only one cosmos. It has no beginning and it has no end. And we can treat it as if it has been designed. So there's a, there's a difference of opinion between Aristotle and Plato here. Plato thinks there's order in the world because it has been imposed externally by some craftsman god on chaos. Aristotle thinks that that order is inherent in the world and it's always been there and always will be there. So there's only one cosmos and there can only be one or cosmos for Aristotle. And again, he would be very much object to the uh, view of um, Leucippus and Democritus on this, because he thinks that cosmos has um, an inherent order to it. So, the ancients, just like every other period of time, had feuding physicists, and they feuded on this issue of matter. It starts with Parmenides and his slightly odd views. It starts with a reaction to Parmenides by Leucippus and Democritus in saying, nope, we're going to have atoms and an empty void. You have Plato having something to say about that in terms of beauty and mathematics and order. And then you have Aristotle saying, <laughs> you're completely wrong, Leucippus and Democritus. There aren't atoms, and there's a whole different way of looking at things. I think that's about it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Gregory. Uh, we do have now a few minutes for questions, and I shall start with the gentleman here in a blue shirt. Great, thank you very much. A br brilliant talk, and I just thought it's not, it's not a question, it's a comment, yeah. but just to connect Plato with where we're sitting. 
um, modern string theory posits that we're all basically made of strings and brains, uh, which would uh, correspond almost exactly to Plato's planes. So um, bearing in mind there are now most probably a score of mathematicians here studying th string theory and um, tens of thousands uh, across the world, it basically shows we've come full circle uh, to Plato's thinking. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I think one has to throw a bunch of caveats around that, of course, because ancient and modern and being cautious about lots of things. But I think fundamentally that there, there is a line of thought which gives, is given its first airing with Plato about beauty, about mathematical simplicity. Now, if I remember my modern particle physics, it all runs off something called Lie groups, which determine how many particles you've got. So when you've got the cyclotron at CERN, you don't go click, oh, what's in there? Firstly, you go to the mathematics and work out the mathematical characteristics of something, and only then do you look for it. I think that's a very platonic thing to do. If you ask me, there's, there's the score between Plato and his opponents is actually one all with one to go. Right? Because I think Plato wins on this question of matter. I think on the issue of um, evolution, Plato is wrong because Darwinian evolution does work by a multiplicity of accidents. On the issue of one cosmos or multiple universes, I think the jury is still out. I think we are still on that question. And I believe physicists are trying to devise experiments to test whether there are multiple universes. I think that, I think that actually misses the point about multiple universes myself, but that's, that's a different issue entirely. Just, just to continue the, uh, the theme of feuds, uh, there's a vast number of physicists who think string theory is, in famous words, not even wrong. Yes. <laughs> okay, so next question is the, from the lady in the red jumper here. Thank you for a superb talk. Was Aristotle an atheist, or did he consider that to be a completely different uh, entity? Um, Aristotle is a theist, and what his god does is thinks about thinking. So what is the best thing that Aristotle thinks that can happen? That is thinking. You can see Aristotle is a bit of a philosopher here. Right? So what would be better than thinking? Well, it must be thinking about thinking. <laughs> um, but Aristotle's God does play an important part in Aristotle's cosmology as well. Because if you ask, why are the heavens moving round in this circular motion? It is for the sake of the prime mover, who is Aristotle's God. So there's, nev there's never a position where Aristotle has to say, I'm beginning the cosmos, I've got to give it a push to get everything going. That's not how Aristotle thinks about things. He thinks that the heavens are, have this natural motion which they execute for the sake of the prime mover. And I, I appreciate that's a strange way of looking at things, but Aristotle has different ways of explaining things. Thank you. I was aware of a question, somebody, yes, gentlemen, yes, in the, in the maroon, yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I've got two questions. The first would be, did the idea of the, the, um, the ether precede uh, Aristotle in the sense that you have five platonic solids, but Plato only had four elements. So did he ever relate the fifth platonic solid to the ether? And the second question would be, if you had some prime matter, if you drop it, will it go? drop of the ground or will it go up? Um, um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, if you had some prime matter, if you genuinely had some prime matter, right, which you can't have according to Aristotle, I think the answer is it wouldn't move at all because it doesn't have any characteristics. You have to add in the qualities before it would have natural motion. So if you gave it the qualities of Earth, then it would have natural motion downwards. If you gave it the qualities of ether, then it would move in a circular motion. I didn't catch the first part of your question. Could you give, give, me, give me that again? So the idea of the ether was, um, as I gather, it was from Aristotle. But uh, Plato, uh, he, there, there are five Platonic solids, yeah. but only four 
elements uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plat- so uh, i was curious whether the ether was yeah. the fifth platonic solid um so yes um you have the issue of the dodecahedron right um plato's a little bit quiet about this <laughs> Um, there, you know, there's a certain beauty to the other four. What Plato says is it's somehow tied up with the cosmos. And I think the, probably the answer to that is that um, if you look at a dodecahedron from certain aspects, it has got 12 points to it, and that points to 12 houses in the zodiac. Um, that needn't be interpreted astrologically, that's just a way of mapping the heavens. Sometimes you see, anachronistically and entirely wrongly, that the dodecahedron is associated with ether. And when I was getting the overheads for this off of um, Google's um, image, there were lots of them which associate the dodecahedron with ether, but that's actually not in Plato. He just says it's tied up with the cosmos somehow. Good. So, gentlemen, here was next. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, my first five to that one, ask two questions if I could. Uh, fortunately, my first one has just been answered. <laughs> uh, my second question was that for Plato, you say uh, the cosmos is designed. Yes. There's some sort of best design. Did he have any suggestions as to who or what was the designer? Yes. Um, in ancient Greek, he is called the Demiurge. Um, and Demiurge literally translates as skilled workman. Right? Now, that's a very interesting thing for Plato to say in itself in the history of Greek theology, because you wouldn't get anything like that in Homer or Hesiod or any of the previous philosophers. Um, this craftsman god um, clearly is also well up on his mathematics and geometry because he crafts the world mathematically and geometry. The first thing that Plato says is that those triangles and the atomic shapes is he marks them out by means of shapes and forms. Um, can we say a lot more about um, this craftsman god for Plato? It's difficult to do so with any great certainty. I think the key thing for Plato is something like this. How is it that we as humans can get some sort of grip on the world? How do we say that this explanation is better than that one. If we assume a god has made everything for the best, then, and has made that mathematically, geometrically, and all the rest of it for the best, then if we make our explanations the best mathematical and geometrical explanations we can, then they will match up to what's actually out there. So I think that god plays an important cosmogonic role, it also plays an important epistemological role for Plato. I'm afraid I can't say a lot more about Plato's god because in, Plato doesn't personify this god. He just says that this god has got a perfectly good will and that means that the world has been made in the best possible way and will persist forever because it'd be a wrong thing for a person with a good will to dissolve the cosmos. So the role of the demigod is to decide what is best? <coughs> yes. As our last question, I'm going to take the gentleman in the penultimate row, pink, uh, red, uh, red shirt. How did Plato decide which shape assigned to which element? Uh, that is a very good question, to which I would be delighted to have a lot more information from, Pla- from Plato. Um, the cube he held to be the most solid and persisting of these shapes and he thought the most solid and persisting of the elements was Earth. Um, He thought that the tetrahedron, because it was the smallest and it had the sharpest faces, was most likely to be associated with air. Uh, Sorry, with fire, because fire cuts things up. So that's that's why the tetrahedron is fire, because it moves quickly, it's got sharp angles, cuts things up. Um, Why the others are water and air, I think that may be lost in the mists of time. Right, but Plato has this sort of loose association like that. Um, one of the great criticisms of it is how empirical of this theory, and the answer is it's not. <laughs> right? And that's, that's no great surprise with Plato because he's into the beauty of it. But I mean, that, that's about as far as we can go with it. Tetrahedron is fire because it's small and cuts things up. Earth is, because Earth looks solid and square, um, sorry, the uh, cube looks solid and square, it's associated with Earth. Thank you very much indeed. We also thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.